I was I was coming through West Lothian the other day and I saw this yellow snow warning. And that's how I knew I was in West Lothian, you know. You, yellow snow. If you if you move to self harmadale then there's certain things that you've got to you've got to learn to uh, expect. I was uh, last night. I was actually I was given the immortal memory at the the Canongate Kirk Bum Supper, and uh, you know tonight at Musselburgh Bowling Club and to go from the from the Unca Gid of uh, the Canongate Kirk Bum Supper to. Kenny Ross, I, I, if there's no a, if there's no a better example of the sublime to the ridiculous, I, I'm not aware of it. It's it's a couple of years since I last did a, a, a an immortal memory here. Obviously, I'm a regular coming along to supper and what have you. But uh, if if you haven't heard me do, a, I, I, I was actually asked, Kenny, Kate, when Kenny says, "I we want you to do the immortal memory," you can just do the same one as you did the last time. They've got rubbish memories. Yeah. <laughs> But so do I, so you know, you'll not get the same one as I did the last time. Uh, because I, I, to be honest with you, I, I never have a good idea where I'm going to go when I start in the morning memory, you know, and perhaps it might turn out a song, perhaps turn out a sermon. Uh, you never know what, what you're going to get. But uh, as it happens, I was thinking about things to say at the Cannon Gate Burn Supper and I had far too much material. So I'm going to give you the stuff that I didn't give them last night, uh, which is largely about patronage. Gentlemen, about about Burns and patronage. Uh, I don't tend to go in for the, uh, you know, talking about his life. I find his life actually quite boring. Maybe I'm singular in this, you know. There's there's nothing remarkable about his life for me, you know. He uh, he was born into an impoverished background and then had to sort of scrape himself through, having managed to get a very good education for his father and what have you. But really, his life ran exactly the way it had to run, given the start that he had in life. So I don't think that there's anything worth examining. And to be honest with you, you all have books on yourself. If you haven't got books, you've got access to Wikipedia. Go and look it up yourself. There's no point in us glossing over his, you know, his life story. But... I think it's interesting just to just to take a look at one aspect of his life and just kind of take it apart a bit, because there's I, I was at a I was at a talk in Register House on Wednesday afternoon I think, uh, Professor Jerry Carruthers of Glasgow University was giving a talk on Burns and the Excise, um, and if you if you don't know Burns was a, a tax collector later on in his life that's what that's what he went on to do, and. Uh, there's a lot of thinking that Burns' politics started to lean rightwards towards the end of his life. And, uh, you know, the thinking is that for someone to go and start working for the government and what have you, uh, obviously this is a, a, you know, this is a good example of how he, uh, you know, he, he just started to get into the establishment and what have you. I mean, you might remember in 2014, all of the political parties wanted to take ownership of Burns. It's sort of like, yes, he's absolutely a unionist. Yes, he's absolutely a nationalist. No, no, he's 100% a socialist. Oh, we think he's a wee bit liberal. And the thing is that he had all of this in his makeup. You can't deny any of it. Uh, I think um, I think it was Edwin Muir that said that we had created a messiah in Robert Burns. And I don't think that that's too far off the mark, to be honest with you guys. You know, we we have made the the national hero that we think that that we feel we ought to have. You know, we've we've made him an attainable figure. We say, oh yeah, I think we could just about manage to match up to that. And I always think it must be about your head scratcher for people. You know, when they come across uh, the fact that Scots revere Robert Burns as their national hero. And you think about the stereotypical image of the Scot, you know, a little bit loud, a little bit aggressive, a little bit sort of mean and what have you. And then, but you've chosen a poet for your national hero. That doesn't seem to fit in somehow. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't fit the trope. Um, but Burns, as I say, could be all things to all people. So if you want someone who's a little bit rowdy, you can find it in Burns. If you want someone who's very caring, you'll find it in Burns. If you want someone who, you know, agrees with the establishment, you can find that in Burns if you look hard enough. But you'll certainly find plenty of stuff that says that he doesn't agree with the establishment.
But the important thing to, to you, you know, for us, us to bear in mind, Burns was not a poor man. Uh, I think, you know, as an example of, uh, most, of, most of the company here, I think, are probably too young to have looked over the Cother Saturday night when you were at school. But this was something, you know, maybe about sort of 60 years ago, if you were going through education, everyone was schooled in the Cother Saturday night. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's a picture of a, a family at their devotions on a Saturday evening and saying that sort of, yes, this is exactly the sort of people that we are in Scotland from scenes like these, old Scotia's grandeur springs that Max are loved at home, revered abroad. Princes and lords are but the breath of kings. An honest man is the noblest work of God. A wonderful sentiment. But certain academics round about the 1950s start saying, mm, I'm not sure that that's really an authentic voice of Burns. You can't pick out one authentic voice of Burns, in my opinion. And certainly you can take a look at songs like, Is There For Honest Poverty? You see yon Berkey called a lord, Wha struts and stares and all that, Though hundreds Worship at his word, he's but a coof for all that, for all that, and all that, his ribbon star, and all that. The man o' oh, independent mind, <laughs> he looks and laughs at all that. This is written pretty close to the end of his life, right about the same time he's writing Scots Wahe. <laughs> which is, it, its proper name is Robert Bruce's March to Bannockburn, and he's addressed to the troops there. But he, he, in the letter that he sent back to the, to the music publisher in Edinburgh, uh, he said that the, the sentiments in Scots were, hey, were ones which were much closer to home. He had recently seen Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill, uh, a great friend of the people, if you, you know that big obelisk that sits in the old Carlton burial ground uh, in Edinburgh, the great big obelisk that, that, that stands up there? That's, that's erected to the memory of Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill and another four political activists, Morris Margaro, somebody scurving, I can't remember all their names, but these were guys who decided at the end of the 18th century that it would be a great idea to give everyone the vote. Now, Edinburgh at that time had a population of about 55,000 or so. How many do you think had the vote? 10,000. 10,000, you reckon, Colin? Any more? 1,500. A couple hundred. 1,500? A couple, hundred? <coughs> couple hundred? Lower? Yeah, 50. Lower? 23. <laughs> 23 individuals had the vote, and one of them was Deacon William Brodie, <laughs> who I'm sure you all know. <laughs> he was one of the 23 who were given the vote. Edinburgh was a very different kind of place from the rest of Scotland and the rest of the UK, in actual fact. You know, most places, it was the landowners who had the vote, but in mercantile boroughs, only the, only the, the, the heads of the Merchants Guild and the heads of the trades had the vote. So Deacon Brodie being the deacon of cabinet makers and rights within the city, had one of these 23 votes. He made very good use of it, I'm quite sure. Um, but Burns had seen Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill being taken away uh, for transportation across to Australia. A fate worse than death, sending a man to Van Diemen's land at a time before they knew how to refrigerate their castle main forex. It was a dreadful place to be. Uh, <laughs> Believe it or not, he actually managed to escape. He escaped from Australia. That's remarkable, isn't it? Hopped aboard an American vessel, found his way back to the US, and eventually over to France. Didn't quite make it back to the UK, passed away in France, Thomas Muir. But a, 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 you know, a giant of a man, a great believer uh, in the common man and uh, you know, the power of the people to raise things above the above the lave and there's a there, there's a song which is picked out by unionists all the time and it's a song called the Dumfriesshire Volunteers Robert Burns towards the end of his life when he was living in Dumfries joined the Royal Dumfriesshire Volunteers which was a like a, a TA regiment if you like raised against the threat 
of, of an invasion from France. This is before Napoleon had taken things over in France, just after the, the revolution. And uh, Burns joined the RDV and people thought, hmm, that's not something that a, a revolutionary would do. And then there was a there was a, there was a, a a big debacle happened in a, a in a theatre in the theatre the theatre royal in Dumfries, um, when uh, some soldiers called for God save the king to be sung, and uh, a certain section of the crowd uh, managed to agitate to have a satira sang instead, which is uh, the song of the French Revolution, and uh, there was a bit of disputation as to whether Burns joined in with one or the other faction. Uh, he claimed that he sat with his, head, with his hat on his head throughout the proceedings and took part in none of it. This is what he claimed to his superiors in the excise. But of course, you know, you're not going to own up to singing a French revolutionary song uh, in public. So what the truth of that is, but we we'll almost certainly never know. But nonetheless, uh, he had to, as a result of this, uh, do something to kind of revitalise his image within society uh, to make sure that he was going to be able to put food on the table for his wife and Wayne's. When he first took over his job on the excise, uh, he had uh, he'd written a letter back to uh, the Reverend Dr Thomas Blacklock, who stayed in the, the Pear Tree House, you know, Pear Tree House where they have the, 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 the beer garden in town. And you'll notice there's a pub round the back of that called The Blind Poet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Blind Poet is the Reverend Thomas Blacklock. And he wrote a letter back to him and he says, But what do you think, my trusty fear? I'm turned a gauger. <laughs> Peace be here. Pernation quines, I fear. I fear you'll no disdain me. And then my 50 pounds a year will little gain me. My glick at glaysome dainty damies. Whoa. The Castilia's wimpling streamies loop, sing and leave their pretty limmies. Ye can, ye can, strang necessity, supreme as man sons of men. I hae a wife and twa wee laddies. They maun hae bros and brats of duddies. Ye can yourself, my heart right proud is, and even if want, but I'll sned beesums and throw soft woodies afore they want. And I think that gets to the heart of it, gentlemen. This is always what's in the back of Burns' mind. I have a family to take care of. And I think that that's possibly the biggest responsibility that Burns ever felt. Even more than having an eye to futurity, even more than being the songwriter for an entire nation, even more than being the fella who collected all the melodies and revitalised it for the whole nation, even more than being a tremendous poet in the Scottish language, more than all of that, he felt the necessity to look after his family. Something that he never shucked away from. Even his wee bastard wains that he had here and there, you know. He wrote a wonderful song uh, when he uh, fell in love with Anna Park, <coughs> uh, Anna is uh, or she was she was a, a barmaid at the Globe Tavern down in Dumfries, and uh, I've I've just recently been asked to do the Immortal Memory uh, at the at the at the Globe in 2020, and I'm really looking forward to it because when you do the Immortal Memory in the Globe, you get to stay in the bedroom where Burns gave Anna a rattle. <laughs> And I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping for a visit from a shade halfway through the night. But, uh, but he, he wrote a wonderful song, and uh, the, uh, you, you know, people said, "Oh, this is absolutely scandalous, Burns. You can't release this." And so he wrote an extra stanza, an extra stanza. He says, "The car can state me join and tell today sick things I canna." The car can state, can gang to hell, and I'll get to my Anna. <laughs> and as soon as Anna found herself pregnant, there was no question in Burns' mind the Wayne would be coming home with him. She eventually came across to, to Edinburgh. We don't really know what happened to her after that. She fell into some 
say, dangerous circumstances after Burns uh, after Burns died, certainly, but she kind of disappears out of her out of out of her ken. But the bairn was brought up with Jean at Ellis, uh, well, at Ellisland originally, and then eventually when they moved through to Dumfries, stayed with them for the rest of, for the rest of her life until she was old enough to to move out. So there was never any question in Burns's mind. Whenever there was a chance begotten Wayne. Of course, they'll come into the fold. Of course, I'll take responsibility for for my actions. Very, very important for them. And it comes to the to, to the heart of everything where Burns seems to need patronage. This is at a time, a generation or so later, Burns could have done very well just from the sale of books. Beethoven was the first musician really to manage to make it on his own. And Beethoven was already writing by the time Burns died. So if he, if he just maybe have been 20 or 30 years later, Burns could certainly have established himself. But at the time that he was living, you could not exist without the patron of some great man. And Burns was acutely aware of this. Acutely aware of this. One of the first poems that he wrote... Uh, well, not one of the first poems that he wrote, that's, that, that, that's a lie, but he certainly he, he wrote a piece of advice which he sent across uh, to the son of a friend of his, Andrew Aiken. Andrew was just about to disappear off to, to college and he wrote a wonderful piece of advice. My father actually sent me a stanza of the epistle to a young friend when I was serving in Berlin. It's stuck with me, really, for the rest of my life. But there's a, there's a wonderful stanza in that where he says, To catch Dame Fortune's gowden smile, Assiduous wait upon her and gave her gear be every while that's justified be honour. No for to hide it in a hedge or for a train attendant, but for the glorious privilege of being independent. Of being independent. Burns had no desire whatsoever to be dependent. On anyone, you see this again in the in the uh, in the two dogs, you know where he's got to oh how they on thole the fact of snatch you stamp and threaten curse and swear apprehend them pin their gear while they on stone we aspect humble and hear it all in fear and tremble. You know, Burns is acutely aware of the fact that people who have have the power over him. See yonder poor o'er laboured wicht, see abject, mean and vile, who begs his brother in the earth to give him leave to toil, and see his lordly fellow worm, his poor petition spurn, uncaring, though a weeping wife and helpless offspring mourn. If I'm designed yon lordling slave, Aye, by nature's law designed. Why was an independent thought here planted in my mind? If no, why am I subject to his cruelty and scorn? And why has man the wit and power to mark his brother mourn? Seeded right throughout his work. Right throughout his work. And it just... I'm sure it must have caused him no end of anguish any time that he had to go chapping on the Earl of Glen Cairn's door or any time he had to write a grovelling epistle to uh, Patrick Muller of Swinton or Robert Gordon of Fintry or anyone else that he required to open doors for him. Because he shouldn't have had to ask for any of this. Possibly the best known person in Scotland at that stage. Certainly one of the cleverest, no doubt about it. Had every qualification that you could possibly ask for to succeed in life, and yet couldn't, couldn't at the end of it. But let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that, that sense and worth o'er all the earth shall bear the grief for all that, for all that and all that, it's coming yet for all that.
that man, the man, the world over, shall brothers be for all that. I really wish things could have turned out better for Burns at the end of the day. He was failed, I think. Failed. And not by not by the commonality of the country. I was, I was in Edinburgh maybe about five or six years before I even realised that there was a Burns monument in Edinburgh. It's not trumpeted. You know, it's, it's just across the road from the, from the high school. For about the next four or five years, I actually thought the Dougald Stewart Memorial, which is the one that's up on Calton Hill, I thought that was the Burns monument. And I'm a Burnsian. I didn't even care where these things were. You can't miss the Scott Monument now, can you? You walk out a Waverley train station, and there it is, this towering, towering, uh, baronial Thunderbird 3 <laughs> thing, soaring up to the skies. Because those that enjoyed Scott, of course, had <laughs> as much money as they wanted to throw at it. But I think it's far more important, gentlemen, that we keep the memory of Robert Burns alive, and we do that in here. And we do this in here. You pick out a £10 Clydesdale banknote, you remember the Burns every time, every time you spend. But it's not enough. And so, gentlemen, I would ask you please to be up on your feet, charge your glasses if you have any, and drink with me the immortal memory of Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Robert Burns.